It's good to see us all here today, gathered in the name of the Lord. Always a wonderful opportunity to go through His Word, to learn. Learn from Him who is gentle and lowly. So if you're visiting us for the first time here at Calvary, we go through the Bible. And right now we are in the book of Acts, uh, the fifth chapter. We are going to finish it today, possibly, from verses 33 to 42. Before that, I just want to uh, you know, remind us, church, of um, the progress of... Um, this land that we've been waiting for, the land that was given to us by the airport. Uh, we've been working out the, you know, the paperwork. And possibly by the beginning of this week, maybe Monday, Tuesday, or whatever time this week, we're going to have the title in the name of our ministry. Amen. And with that, you know, it means we can do application for KPLC and officially begin work there. We have engaged the people drilling the borehole and uh, building the tower. So as soon as we have it, then we are out there at the land working. So as many of you who will be willing to come and work, <laughs> there is work to be done. We want to try and build four houses at the same time. So uh, we, we thank God for this provision. It's been long awaited, but we see God working through it. And thank you for praying for it as we continue to pray for God's provision also for that. So it is quite a blessing, and it is interesting for us. <laughs> We've been writing letters and sending them back and forth. It is wonderful what God is doing. So, yeah, before we read God's word, let us pray together again. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your mercies that are new every morning. We thank you that you have given us an opportunity to gather together as your people, as your children. And as we read your word, we pray that you give us insight, you give us wisdom through it for life. Give us understanding of it so that we may abide by it and live by it, Lord. As we read it together this morning, we pray that you bless your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So we begin from verses 33 of Acts chapter 5. When they heard this, they were furious and plotted to kill them. Then one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in high respect by all the people, and commanded them to be put, to put the apostle outside for a little while. And when he said to them, Men of Israel, take heed to yourself. What do you intend to do regarding this man? For some time ago, Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of census and drew away many people after him. He also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. 
But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. And they agreed with him, and when they had called for the apostle and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Our topic today is counted worthy. Previously, as we read last week, we saw that this man got angry and they did take the apostles into a common prison for violating the command of the elders, the chief officials. They were taken in there, and the Bible told us that at night, an angel of the Lord came and unbound them, opened the, the doors for them, and let them out. And he gave them a command. He said, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life, all the words of eternal life. That is your responsibility. That is your job, what you ought to do. And that is exactly what they did. Early in the morning, they went to the temple and they were teaching people. So when this council gathered together again to bring the apostle for questioning, they were not in there and they wondered what happened. Why? They said the locks were there securely and the guards were watching. <laughs> so I wonder whom the guards were watching. <laughs> the people there that were taken in are out, but they're still out there watching. They're doing their job. It's quite amazing that they didn't even realize that we don't have people inside. <laughs> so they brought them without violence, lest the people would stone them. They asked them, you know, why did you choose to do this? Because we told you not. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we must obey God rather than man. That is what we're going to do. We must obey God. And these people would get angrier and angrier and angrier. But now we get to see another man who is named, mentioned here who is called Gamaliel. On the surface, if we hear what he is talking about, and then we might be tempted, or we will actually say, this is a wiser guy. And truth be told, he was a learned guy. He was the professor who taught Paul. And what he said of Paul is that Paul, the only trouble he had with Paul, that he didn't have enough books to give to Paul. Paul was very diligent in reading. He was a sharp guy. And everyone esteemed Gamaliel because of his status in uh, that time. Gamaliel was a Pharisee who probably did not want to see the Sadducees win any victories. You remember the Sadducees were the people who were against the resurrection. They did not believe in it. And now you have a Sadducees who wants not these people to punish them because they were uh, plotting to kill them. And now they're having um, conflicts within their sect. 
He was a scholar, highly esteemed by the people, but rather liberal in his application of the law and apparently moderate in his approach to the current problem that we have here. And when Rabban, or they called him Rabbi, Rabbi teacher, Gamaliel died, the Jewish people said the glory of the law has ceased and purity and abstinence has died. This was a very highly educated man. When he died, people were like, we have lost it. We have lost purity. For in their eyes, he was the man who kept it. But we're going to see that his, his mind was not right in a lot of things as he deliberated in this issue. In spite of the fact that Gamaliel tried to use cool logic rather than overheated emotions, his approach was wrong. To begin with, he automatically classified Jesus with two rebels. See his example? He's saying, Theodos came, men followed him, and when he was died, this guy was cut. Another man came, called Judas of Galilee. He died, and all his followers was cut. Now we have Jesus, and these are his followers. Who knows? It is actually wicked to classify Jesus amongst these people. But in the worldly wisdom, we might think that this guy is wise. Because the other people are plotting to kill the disciples, for they, they don't have a proper reason really to punish them or to hold them because they're doing what is right and the testimony of what God has done is before their eyes. But this man is trying to be clever to classify Jesus with these two rebels, which means he had already rejected the evidence. The evidence was there with the people. What was happening? The man who was healed, they saw it and they thought, man, we we cannot deny this. We know this man, he has been here. This is legit. What are we going to do about it? He did not cite the evidence before beginning to talk. So to him, this Jesus of Nazareth was, was another zealous Jew trying to set the nation free from Rome. Did Titus or Judas die for the sins of people? What kind of miracles did they do? Where did they come from? I mean, if he didn't mention them, we could have not known them. Just people who showed up for something. They wanted to be great for some reasons. That was very wicked of him to think that these people were supposed, you know, Jesus is supposed to be classified with these people. Were, Were these people raised from the dead? None of them. They died and all their followers was cutted. They didn't die for anyone's sin. They, didn't, they were not rose again. Furthermore, Gamaliel assumed that history repeats itself, as we normally say, right? History repeats itself. So if this man, these two gentlemen came, this is what happened to them. In other words, this is what I'm telling you. Here you go. It will repeat itself. So don't get worried about this man so much. 
Judas and Judas rebelled, were subdued, and their followers were scattered. So he's saying, give these Galileans enough time, they too will disband, I will, and you will never again hear about Jesus of Nazareth. What was the wisdom of Gamaliel? You know, Gamaliel also had the mistaken idea that if something is not of God, it must fail. And we see logically in our world, there are many things that are not of God that are still existing today. Many things that are of Satan, Satan himself is still here with us. <laughs> so it would, it would fail to give proper judgment when you say, you know, anything that is not will fail. While we see many things that are not of God still present with us. God, in his sovereignty, has allowed things to be what they are right now. Very mistaken about things. This idea does not take into consideration the sinful nature of man and the presence of Satan in the world. Many bad things are happening, as well as many good things are happening. You know what they say? False cults often grow faster than God's church. They come. They grow everywhere, everywhere. And so in his idea, is like this thing that comes so fast, they're just going to die too soon. Gamaliel did know who he was messing with. This world is a battlefield on which truth and error are in mortal combat. Right and wrong. Why do we have government officials telling us not to read the Bibles in public? Because it tells us what is right and what is wrong. While the world is trying to coin what is right with their own standards. You know, the biggest weakness of this advice was his motive. He encouraged neutrality when the council was facing a life and death issue that demanded a proper decision. He, he's a learned fellow, pretty bright, and this council is at the crossroad. And what need to divide these people is only the truth or error. It's either you are of the truth or you're not. There is no in between. And Gamaliel is trying to walk his way to be the in between kind of guy. He's not saying, you know, I am of God. He's not saying, I am really supporting you. He's just sailing in the middle of it. 
failing. This is a matter of life and death, but yet he's not giving a proper decision. Jesus made it clear that it is impossible to be neutral about him and his message. He that is not with me is against me. And he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Matthew chapter 12. If you're not of me, of, if you're not with me, you're against me. That is how it goes. There's only two ways. It's either you choose Christ or you choose Satan. There's no in-between. No in-between at all. And perhaps these members of the council knew the words of Elijah. Remember Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 21. He said, how long will you waver between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. If Baal, follow him. But the people kept quiet. <laughs> For how long? You know, James also helps us. He says, a double-minded person cannot receive anything of the Lord. You cannot. Choose the way you're going to follow. Say that you follow God or you follow Baal. For how long will you be torn between these two? If Gamaliel was really afraid of fighting against God, there are a few things that he could have done. Four things, I believe. Number one, he could have honestly investigated the evidence. And number two, diligently search the scripture. And number three, carefully listen to the witnesses. And number four, ask God for wisdom. If he was what we thought he was, a very wise man who has read the Torah, he's read the Old Testament, he got it. But then these things didn't matter to him at all. It was, if he was really afraid of fighting with God, he did not do these things. This was a greatest opportunity of a lifetime for Gamaliel to actually explain the scripture to people, tell them about the Messiah, about the coming Lord. But he failed in doing that. A man called Daniel Defo claimed that nobody was born a coward. Truth makes a man of courage. And guilt makes that man of courage a coward. What's a man called caution, God would call it cowardice. You have an opportunity to witness but you want to be neutral. You want to be politically correct before the people so that perhaps your influence will continue. You don't want to divide people. You want people to be on your side. 
But we see that the apostles were true ambassadors, while Gamaliel was really only a religious politician. A religious politician. That is what he became of. And he would speak here and people would think, man, You say in verse 38, and now I say to you, keep away from this man and let them alone. If this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found fighting against God. <laughs> Seems right, right? You know, this, this, this argument, the only part that it saved, it saved the apostle from being killed with this man. Because he, 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 he could quiet down his own people, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. They were, you know, they thought that was wisdom. And they, in a way, didn't want to mess with God, too. They were told, hey, perhaps you guys can find yourself fighting with God. I mean, who, do you, do you know what it means to fight with God? <laughs> you don't want to fight with God. That is already a lost battle. You cannot win. This kind of wisdom is crafty. It's very crafty. Be careful. Because if he was true to his word, he could have said, this is of God. You cannot overthrow it. The battle you guys are fighting, you are fighting the most high God. Period. It's like, well, if... It's not a question of if. This is the reality. You're fighting against God by trying to stop this man from preaching the true gospel. Let them alone. And unanimously, they agreed. They agreed with him. And they called the apostles. And do you know what they did to them? They scourged them. They did beat them. So like, well, thank you for your advice, Mr. Gamaliel, but they ain't going to go out just like that. <laughs> we, we're going to give them a proper timeout. <laughs> oh, amazing. We're going to beat them up. Perhaps this will scare them. Last time we just sent them out. We didn't uh, beat them. They did it again. This time around, we are going to beat them so that perhaps they will shut their mouth. And this, we see this kind of idea through all the scripture. You remember the story of Esther. She was told, who knows the reason why God has brought you to this palace at such a time? Perhaps by your hand, the Hebrew, the Jewish people will be saved. But also, if you're not going to do it, know for sure that God will bring deliverance from someone else. So the question is, do you want to do it or you want God to bring someone else to do it? Do you want to do it? Do you want to speak or you want to shut up? You have an opportunity to share Christ 
just letting it go. You're, you're just wishing maybe, you know, elder so-and-so, maybe the pastors. Let me invite the pastors to my home. Perhaps I will link them up with this neighbor of mine that will talk and I will just be agreeing with them. Yes, pastor. Yes. <laughs> you have an opportunity every time, I believe, every time to share the gospel. But we get fearful. We get fearful. It is very significant that the first group named among those who go to hell is the group that is fearful or the cowards. In Revelation chapter 21 verses 8. The people who knew the truth but were afraid to take their stand. It is amazing to me. <laughs> you know it. You don't want to do something about it. And honestly, that is the one thing that scares me. That I know a lot of things. I have read the Bible. And a lot of things from the Bible. I don't do those things. <laughs> I've let my flesh to take over. I want to be a coward. I want to be like the apostles. Who they're saying to us here, they were counted worthy. Counted worthy. Part of the council wanted to kill the apostles. But Gamaliel's speech destroyed their violence. But it, it was a compromise. It was a compromise. So these people decided to beat the apostles and let them go. Then the apostles were commanded to stop speaking in the name of Jesus lest something worse happen to them. You see, when people refuse to deal with disagreement on the basis of principles and truth, they often resort to verbal or physical violence. You refuse to think straight. You refuse to have um, sensible you know, dialogue or you are refusing to receive the truth, wishing it away, you know what happens? People want to be violent. They resort to violence. Because we cannot win this battle, at least what we can do, we can beat them up. We can scourge them at least. The sad thing is that this violence often masquerades as patriotism or as religious zeal. When understanding fails, violence starts to take over. When understandings will fail, violence starts to take over. And the people begin to destroy each other in the name of their nation, they are protecting their religion, they are protecting their God. It is very tragic. This man called William Temple said very profound words here. He said that Christians are called to the hardest of all tasks, to fight without hatred. Do you know what that means? <laughs> to fight without hatred, to resist without bitterness, to resist without bitterness. 
And in the end, if God grants it, to triumph without vindictiveness. It is a serious cause, friends. You know, when Jesus says, you know, you love your enemies, we probably don't understand the depth of what he says. <laughs> love them. You say, oh, okay. Love your neighbors as you love yourselves. Because we, all, we already have a problem of loving ourselves too much. Love your neighbors. Love your enemies and pray for them. You know, that kind of logic will help you to do things properly. That even when you're offended, you know what the Bible tells us? You be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath. Because if you do, you give a full hold to the enemy. Don't let that happen. Don't give the enemy a foothold. And that is what, what Mr. William is telling us that we are called to. To fight without hatred. To resist without bitterness. How do we do that? In ourselves. There's nothing that is able to do that. If we are not clothed with the righteousness of Christ, we are not able to do any of this. A honest man called Paul of Tarsus says, Nothing good dwells in me. He says, The things I want to do, I find myself not doing. The things I hate doing, I find myself consistently doing. I'm becoming a pro of the things that I hate. Friends, being a Christian is a higher calling. It is a higher calling. It is not something to be taken lightly. How did the apostles respond to this illegal treatment from the nation's religious leaders. How did they respond to it? The Bible tells us they rejoiced. <laughs> These are the exact opposite of these religious leaders. I mean, how do you rejoice when you're scourged? How do you rejoice when you're beaten? You're, you're, you're walking out of this council with bloody clothes. You're, there's pain all over you. And you're like, hey, what a wonderful God we serve. I mean, the, I can't even imagine it. You, 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 you throw a punch at me. You know what I'll do the next? <laughs> Without hesitating. We will equalize things, right? <laughs> you throw it, I throw it back. You bite me, I bite you. <laughs> that is the natural man. They're scored and they're saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. It is, it is amazing. It amazes me. You know, the Bible tells us here, when they agreed, and they agreed with him, and when they had called the apostles, they beat them and commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they did let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. These were the eyewitnesses of Jesus Christ. They saw the shame of the cross. And they also saw the joy. Because the Bible tells us that Jesus despised the shame of it. 
for what was ahead. And these men, they've drunk from the same sauce. And they're saying, voila, this is awesome. At least we can be counted worthy that we have suffered. We have suffered for his name's sake. Perhaps many of us will not go through this kind of beating. But people will talk bad about you. They will hate on you. They hate on your children. They will deny you opportunities because you are a believer. Because you are a Christian. Friends, this calling is a higher calling. If you have received it, Paul says, you work it out with fear and trembling. Walk in reverence of the Lord. Walk in the fear of the Lord. They rejoiced. I mean, who, who gets happy for these kind of things? And do you know why they're happy? Because Jesus had told them to expect persecution and had instructed them to rejoice. That is in Matthew chapter 5, verses 10 through 12. Jesus told them ahead of time. So what is happening is true. They believe in their master and their Lord. What he says is true, and we are going to do it. The opposition of man meant the approval of God. And it was actually a privilege to suffer for his name's sake. It was a privilege for this gentleman. Do we count it as a privilege for us? We have the truth with us. We have it. You see, these threats did not make this man to say, well, we are not going to do it anymore. They continued. Neither the threats nor the beatings stop them from witnessing for Jesus Christ. And if anything, this persecution only made them trust God more and seek greater power in their ministry. True believers are not quitters. You don't quit because you're in trouble. You continue fighting. Paul says, I lay everything aside as I pursue the goal. And you see, the Bible tells us here that also they witnessed daily. This means they took advantage of the witnessing opportunities no matter where they were whether it's in the temple or in their small houses. And you guys know that, you know, the, the, the fellowship is more intimate at home. Fellowship is more intimate when you're hanging out with people beside these four corners. Hanging out maybe in a hotel somewhere, just talking to people. It is quite fulfilling. It is quite encouraging and enriching. And they took advantage of that, the Bible tells us, and daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as Christ. They never ceased. They spoke about him daily. The apostles had a commission to fulfill. 
They intended to continue as long as the Lord enabled them. So we see their pattern is always teaching and preaching, teaching and preaching, teaching and preaching, witnessing of what God did for them. The early Christians also witnessed to their neighbors. You know, the fact that they were in every house means their influence also was expanding. People would see how they love one another, how they care for one another. And they would say, hey, if, if, if this is salvation, I want it. If you guys are worshiping a true God, I want it. I want to be part of this. I want to be part of what God is doing. Their ministry went on without ceasing. The authorities had told them to stop witnessing, but they only witnessed the more. Their motive was not defiance to the law, but rather obedience to the Lord. Obedience to the Lord. That was the key drive for them. Do you think you have opportunities to share Jesus Christ? Or have you prayed for opportunities to share Jesus Christ with people? You know, as we sharing and proclaiming, we, we, we got to have a balance with instructions so that the sinners know what to believe and the new converts understand why they believe in whom they believe in. How can you know without receiving explanation? Or just away. Oh, hey, just believe, just believe. That's all you need. It, it, it is good, we know. You just have to believe in Christ, but then we need an explanation of who, who Christ is. Tell me more about him. Explain to me. You know, the, I, I want to know this salvation story. W when did it begin? Tell people about Christ. Explain. How will they know if no one or none is sent to them? And how can they believe if it's not explained to them? This is the witnessing that we see here. And finally, it was Jesus Christ who was the center of their witness. That was the very name that the Sanhedrin had condemned. The early church did not go about arguing religion or condemning the establishment. They simply told people about Jesus Christ and asked them, to trust in him. And Paul says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Jesus Christ our Lord. We do not preach ourselves. The message that we bring to you is not from ourselves. Because we have many other people who will preach themselves using the Bible. We've got to be careful. We have a lot of them in the world. If you do not know 10 of them, higher chance is you're listening to them, the false teachers and prophets. If you do not know 10 of them, the possibility is you're even currently in your homes with your televisions, or even the books you read, belongs to them. 
Many people are in the world, like Gamaliel, who seems to speak words that are soothing to people. They will mention the, the, the name of God in a conversation or in their speech, but their intention is not to draw people to God. We have seen them. We, we have records online of men, heretics, who said we are not going to preach that gospel anymore. We are not going to solicit money from people anymore. You guys know that? We've seen them. You guys remember Benny Hinn, what he did? He said, I'm not going to do that anymore. As soon as he was out of the TV, what did he do? Went straight back. Because that is what he knows how to do. And you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees? That they will cross land and sea to make one proselyte twice the son of hell. That is more dangerous. That is more fearful. They want to make people sons of hell. But when they come, they come in the name of the Lord. You guys know that the government has paid for him to come in the country? I'm sorry for poking some of your bubbles. I know many of you listen to these people. Be careful, people. Be careful. When he was repenting of that, I, it wasn't a real repentance anyways. When he was making that statement, I was happy that at least we have one who is saying, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to leave these things. As soon as, you know, he just wanted to be politically correct again. Or else he will lose a lot of funding and a lot of influence. These disciples, do you think they were, my, they, were, they were just preaching Jesus so that they become famous? They wanted people to see the kingdom. And they were commanded to preach the words of life. Do you know that the people you listen to, they in a way structure how you think about issues? <laughs> Your worldview. You can't be listening to a heretic and remain to be sober. You can't. And trust me, it's not an easy thing to come out of. Because that is where I got born again. I was listening to them after this, after this preacher, after this preacher. The Lord in his mercy helped me out. The Lord always is willing to help us out. But, you know, sometimes what we'll say, you know, I've, I've not had, you know, some bad things with their... Do you know what is interesting? There are times you can listen to their sermons and they'll say nothing that is wrong. <laughs> they'll say everything that is right in some particular selected sermon. And you're like, so, so, so what's your problem? <laughs> Gamaliel said what was right. What was the problem with it? The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Let it sink with us. As I bring the worship team to come. We don't like, or I don't like to be a controversial person. Because I love my peace. <laughs> I love peace. Trust me. But also, I'm training myself to be bold 
and say what God has told me to. If you say you preach the word in and out of season, we are not preaching ourselves. We are preaching Jesus Christ crucified. If it will cost me friendships, I'd rather. I'd rather keep people who believe in what I believe and speak truth and also do it in love. Amen? It is not an easy calling. We've got to train ourselves to obey God. Peter said we must. We must obey God. That is why they rejoiced. They rejoiced that they were counted worthy. To do what? To be partakers of what Jesus Christ also partook of. The cup of shame. We do not preach ourselves. By the Lord Jesus Christ. Be diligent. There are men, we are going to get them in the later chapters of Acts, we're called the Bereans, men who did search the scriptures. It doesn't matter if it's Gamaliel, it's Paul, it's all the apostles. If you ain't making sense, they ain't going to listen to you. <laughs> they are the seekers of truth, not seeker friendlies. <laughs> Do you have confidence in God? Yo, we, we also have a group in the book of Acts. Oh, in the uh, middle of a fellowship, you know, they said, we, we come to you in the name of Jesus Christ that Paul preached. <laughs> Sons of Ke Scaphers, you remember them? <laughs> they say, hey, Jesus we know. Paul we know. Who are you? Who are you? They will run naked. <laughs> Do you know Jesus? Do you know what He's done for you? In response to what He's done, what you're going to do? Do you just want to show up on a Sunday morning? And never do anything the rest of your lives. It is wonderful to meet together with God's people, to fellowship together. He's commanded us. What about the rest of the six days at, at your home, at your workplace? Do we see Christ in you? That's a challenge for you to think. There are always opportunities. Of course, you don't turn your shop to a church. Be wise about it. Be diligent as you do so. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for the privilege you've given to us. Thank you that we are called by your name. And thank you for the strength that you've given us also to preach your word. We do not preach something that is of ourselves. We preach you crucified, resurrected, and alive. And we pray that this conviction will rest with us, that you're indeed God, that you are indeed our Savior. Thank you for the many doors you have opened for us to share your word. Help us to be diligent to follow them up. And as we 
give to you this morning our offerings, our finances. We pray that we'll give that which brings you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.